Hi, welcome to part three of the CNC controller build series. The controller was actually finished at the end of part two, but I've done some upgrades to it and fixed some things, mostly based on the feedback that I received from viewers on the previous videos. It turned out that this project received quite a lot of interest and many people took the time to provide feedback in the comment section, which was very helpful and much appreciated. I will start this video with changes I made to add some more functionality to the controller. I've added the power socket that can be switched on or off from within the milling program for a coolant pump or other accessories. Also, I added a USB hub for simultaneous use of a USB stick and an external keyboard. The fourth axis was upgraded with a closed loop stepper drive and homing switches were added to the X, Y and Z axes. Besides these upgrades, I've added a surge suppression diode to the contactor, made some changes to the power supplies and last but not least, grounding. I did not properly ground the shielded wires in the earlier videos, so I will make an attempt to correct this by adding round wires where needed. A link to the updated wiring diagram can be found in the description below. So let's get into it. My CNC router is equipped with a water-cooled spindle. Coolant is pumped through the spindle housing in order to keep temperature stable. This is done with a simple aquarium pump which is submerged in a tank with coolant. It is nice to be able to switch the pump on at the start of the program and to turn it off automatically when the program is finished. The DDCS controller has two inputs that can be used for this purpose. Pin 3 is controlled by the M8 and M9 commands in an NC program, and pin 22 is controlled by the M10 and M11 commands. These outputs pull the ground when activated, so you have to place a relay between the positive common terminal and one of the mentioned pins. In my case, I'm using M8 and M9, and I placed an old-fashioned mechanical relay between the positive common pin 20 and pin 3. I'm using a classic relay because this allows me to switch both the neutral and the live wire. Since I'm working with a wall plug that can be rotated 180 degrees, I cannot be sure which line is the live wire and which one is the neutral wire, so I'm switching both wires. The M8 command can be used from the program to turn the output on, and the M9 command is used to turn it back off. In the DDCS controller, you can also manually switch the output from the main screen if needed. Let's have a look at the USB functionality of the DDCS controller. Typically, you would load a program made with your CAM software onto the controller using a USB drive. The controller only has a single USB port. Besides the USB memory stick, this port can be used to connect the keyboard, but obviously not at the same time. The keyboard can be very useful since not all functions can be operated from the keys on the controller itself. The solution is a USB hub. I thought it might be possible to connect the USB hub, and sure enough, when researching this online, it turned out that people had already done this successfully. The DDCS Facebook group is a great resource for information on controllers from this brand. I bought a cheap USB hub and attached it to the front panel using some Velcro and double-sided tape, so it can be easily removed if needed. You can actually use a wireless USB keyboard as well, 
The second USB plug was installed on top of the cabinet. This does increase the risk of the debris falling into the connector, but this is easily fixed with the 3D printed cover. Next up is a closed loop stepper drive for the fourth axis. The connectors to the closed loop stepper drive are very similar to that of an open loop drive. On the outer left, there's a power connector. The unit runs on anything between 24 and 48 volts DC. Next to it is the connector for the stepper motor with the typical A minus, A plus, B minus, and B plus connections. This connector is for the encoder signal which provides continuous feedback on the position of the motor axis. Together with the stepper motor connector, this forms the so-called closed loop. The enable connector is not used in this project. When left unconnected, the drive is enabled. Next to it, we have the connections for the pulse and direction signals. This is where the DDCS provides a signal to the stepper driver in order to make it go to the desired position. And lastly, the alarm connector, which is closed by the stepper drive in case the motor gets too far out of position. All of the stepper drives on my router were the open loop type. This is what you typically find on the cheaper machines. With these open loop systems, you have the risk of missing steps in case a motor gets overloaded or you crash into something. The controller will not know about this and will just continue on as if nothing has happened, but now at a different position. The next upgrade from an open loop stepper driver is a closed loop stepper driver. These have now dropped in price quite significantly over the last years. The term closed loop can be a bit misleading, because in this case, the closed loop is between the stepper driver and the motor, not between the motor and the controller. If the motor now loses steps, the stepper driver will try to correct for the error. It will keep trying to rotate the motor into the intended position. It will not give up unless the error gets too large. If that happens, it will error out and completely turn off the stepper motor and go into alarm mode. This will close the two alarm terminals. I have connected these to an e-stop input on the DDCS controller, so even though the closed loop does not reach the controller, it can still be put into alarm mode in case there is an issue. So if the closed loop motor is overloaded, it will trigger an alarm and the entire machine will stop, including the spindle and all other axes. An added benefit of closed loop steppers is that they only use as much current as needed to keep the motor in its intended position, so they run less hot and consume less power. Of course, there are also drawbacks. Closed loop steppers are still more expensive than open loop systems, and you need to wire in an additional cable. For the stepper motor I bought, I had to solder it to a connector myself. In this case, I used an 8-pin GX16 connector. Six wires are going to the rotary encoder. The seventh wire is connected to the shield of the cable and fed through the controller housing. At the inside, it is connected to the shield of the wire running to the stepper drive. At the end of that cable, a ground wire is soldered to the shield and connected to the central ground point. But more on that later on in this video. Soldering GX16 connectors becomes increasingly more difficult the more pins it has. An alternative for an encoder cable would be an RJ45 connector. You do have to crimp the connector to the encoder wire yourself, and from experience I know that this also requires some practicing before you get it right. Make sure wires are not too long, since it's very difficult to deal with any access wires due to the small connector housing. If you push the wires in too hard, they may short out or bend the pins. I'm connecting the shield to the chassis ground. For stepper signals, it's recommended to connect the shield at the controller end. However, for the encoder signal, I'm connecting the ground at the stepper driver's side, since I can use shorter ground wires here. 
Since I was doing some work on the machine, I thought it might be a good idea to also add homing switches. You can run a CNC router without these, but they do make working with the machine easier. I decided not to add limit switches at this point. They are also useful, but require even more wiring. I will use homing switches in combination with soft limits. This is not as safe as having limit switches, but it does add some level of safety from going outside of the working area in case of a program error or when the work coordinate system is chosen too close to the machine limit. With the homing switches installed, I can home the machine after startup. The machine will now know where it is with respect to the machine coordinates. You can set the travel limits of the machine in the DDCS controller. This will stop the machine if any point outside the work envelope is programmed. I bought two types of limit switches, some cheap ones and some very cheap ones. The smaller switches are used for the X and Z axes, while the larger one is used for the Y axis. I do not have a dial gauge that is accurate enough to say anything about the repeatability of these micro switches, but in general micro switches are quite repeatable, with a standard deviation of around 5 to 10 microns, also depending on whether or not you use a type with a lever. Soft limits will also work when jogging the machine. So let's have a look at the surge suppression diode for the contactor. When initially building this controller, I used a separate power supply for the contactor. This was to prevent damaging any electronics due to the voltage spike created by the contactor when it's turned off. This is a typical characteristic for contactors. The energized coil releases its energy when the contactor disengages, resulting in a short voltage spike which can reach several hundreds of volts. There are actually several types of surge suppressors available for contactors. 
I opted for a regular diode. This kills the voltage spike completely. It only works for DC type contactors, which is what I'm using. Also, it is only available for the smaller Siemens S00 type. The diode does add a delay of a couple of milliseconds, but this is not a problem for my application. Now that I have the surge suppression diode, I felt comfortable enough to connect the contactor to the same power supply that is used for the DDCS controller. I made some more changes here. Initially, I used a small power supply which was dedicated to the DCS controller and used this to power both the unit itself as well as the I.O. In a later revision of the manual, I actually found that it was recommended to use separate power supplies for this. One power in the controller and a separate power supply for the I.O. This should help prevent electrical noise. I did not like the form factor of the old smaller power supply anyway, so I took that out and now I'm using two DIN rail mounted models. Previously, I had the Noctua fan connected to 24 volts as well. This fan is actually a 12 volt model. I did know this when I bought it, but simply forgot it by the time I got around to installing it. This is easily rectified with a step down converter. I still had one laying around as a leftover from another project. The step down converter takes 24 volts as an input and delivers 12 volt to the output lines. Since the fan is obviously spinning slower at 12 volts, I removed the low speed adapter to make sure there's still enough airflow. The measured noise level is still very low. I received a lot of comments on the topic of grounding, which was very helpful, so thank you for that. Admittedly, I cut some corners and in some cases I just didn't know what the best practices were for grounding. After some more research on the topic, I tried to improve on the situation. The changes are based on the following principles. I'm connecting all ground wires to a single point in the cabinet in order to prevent ground loops. Shielded wires are grounded on one end and then the ground wire is led to the same central grounding point. Anything that's already connected to the metal backplate is not grounded again with a separate wire also to avoid ground loops. An example of this is the larger power supply. As a central grounding point, I'm using a ground bar that's typically used for grounding wires in buildings, but it should suffice here. Lastly, this grounding block is connected to the ground connector of the mains power plug. All wires should be thick wire gauge and as short as possible. I found the location in the center of the cabinet for the ground bar, which might not be the ideal location, but given that everything else was already fixed in place, I will keep it like this for now. Also, I tried to ground the spindle, but I found that there were only three wire leads going out to the spindle and not a spare wire that I could use for grounding. So as a temporary solution, I added a separate ground wire and connected that to the spindle housing. The wire is fed back through the drag chains to the central grounding point inside the controller. This is meant as a temporary solution until I get a good four wire cable from which I can use one of the leads as the ground wire. I will also replace the spindle connector since the GX16 connector is too light for this application.
I was recommended to use a WS20 connector by one of the people in the comments. This seems perfectly usable for this application. And in fact, on the spindle end, this type of connector is already used. In addition to that, I'm now going for a female socket, since the male connector could cause a dangerous situation if you unplug the connector. If you need to know more about grounding, I would recommend the channel Corvette Guy 50. He has a number of videos dedicated to grounding, and it seems like he's very knowledgeable on this subject. So that's it for this update. Make sure to check out the description of this video and the comment section, where I will post updates in case there are more changes to the wiring setup or grounding. Please leave a like if this information was useful for you and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Thanks for watching.